All right. Welcome back, everybody, to session number nine, I believe it is, of the DCP Live. This is the uh, version of the podcast where we help walk through some of the technical details of our kind of detection engineering process. Our goal is to help to provide some of the fundamental skills that people would need if they're getting into the detection engineering kind of sub-discipline within information security. I'm your host, Jared Atkinson, with my co-host, Jonathan Johnson, over there, J Security 101. And then we got Luke Payne, our producer, who he's actually going to potentially take a little bit more of an active role in tonight's session. So hopefully, hopefully people enjoy that aspect. Um, okay. Johnny was having issues with his internet connect connectivity after I had issues with my internet connectivity. So everybody cross your fingers and hope that this thing goes well. Again, uh, check us out at DCP podcast on YouTube or DCP the podcast on, um, on Twitter. We, we really would appreciate you know, the subscribers and things like that on YouTube and uh, kind of help grow, grow the podcast. All right. So last week, Johnny talked about uh, telemetry, right? And one of the things that he, he really dug into is how, like, what are the mechanisms that we use to generate, that EDRs use to generate telemetry? The, the major mechanism that he covered were these things called kernel callback functions. And the, the idea here was that you can, uh, the vast majority, I think it's probably safe to say, Johnny, correct me if I'm wrong, but a, a large portion of EDR telemetry is being generated in the kernel based on these callback functions. Is that an accurate statement? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Vast majority is maybe like a little nebulous. A good, so a good amount of a good amount of telemetry. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. And so and so that's that's awesome. So at this point we've kind of talked through this idea of like analyzing tools to get an idea for how they work. We look at the different functions uh, that are that are capable um, or the different the different functions that a tool will use. We then talked about the function call stacks, which is this, when you call uh, kernel 32 open process behind the scenes without you knowing implicitly, there's a bunch of function calls that get that get that are made, uh, such as kernel base, open process, NT DLL, NT open process, and a syscall called, you know, NT open process. And, uh, and then we kind of g translated that into these things that we call operations. And operation in this case for open process is going to be process the process open operation, but there's also, for instance, the process read open or process read operation. There's a file write operation. There's all kinds of different operations. And one of the things that we really touched on before we got into the telemetry generation is the way that we start to understand really what what's going on when a tool is used or what a behavior is is something that's uh, that we call the operation chain. This is the sequence of operations that a tool uses to perform some behavior right and and then we went off kind of what seemed to be a little bit of a tangent but we started talking about telemetry right and this episode what we really want to do is kind of tie those things together and say hey we understand you know how a large portion of telemetry is being generated we understand what operations these different tools or malware samples are using to perform certain behaviors how do we marry those things together so that we can actually start to start to do some detection, right? I don't know, Johnny. Johnny, uh, one thing that is probably worth announcing is today Johnny released a blog post on kernel callbacks, and so I encourage people to check that out. We'll share that. I don't know if Luke's ready to drop that on the bottom here, but uh, if you go to uh, the Spectre Ops Medium or the J Security One Hundred One Medium account, you'll see you'll see that uh, post there. So, Johnny, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you real quick, just to kind of put a bow on anything that I was talking about or add to it. Yeah. So um, one thing I wanted to point out is Jared here in a little bit is going to show the function call stack and function uh, <clears throat> function graph in general. Whenever he mentions um, a syscall, right, he is, he's relaying that to some function that has a name like NT open process. <clears throat> it's important to know that syscalls don't have function names. Um, but the reason why we're doing that is because that's the native function that invokes that syscall and syscalls are going to be a, some numeric value that then goes and gets looked up by the system service dispatch table, which essentially is a pointer to some kernel function gets invoked. Um, we don't know always what those values are. We can tell you for that specific build of that Windows machine. Um, however, those values do change depending on the version and whatever it may be. So, so that the call graphs are more long lasting. Um, he is saying the syscall is the NT function, but that's just what's going to invoke that. So just kind of keep that in mind. We'll probably talk about, you know, syscalls more in the future and how to maybe find those and maybe 
do like a cool stream of where you like showing windy bug and finding those functions. Um, but just kind of keep that in mind that that's why you will see two of the same at the bottom. Yep. Yeah. There's a, uh, just for, to kind of explain that there's, there's a table in the kernel called the SSDT, right? The system services dispatch table, I believe that stands for. And that yep. is a dispatch table, which is essentially full of function pointers, I believe. Mm -hmm. And those function pointers point to the kernel kernel mode functions that cor correspond with those syscalls, right? And the syscall, I think, like let's say the syscall is 55. That's the value that's for the syscall. That means the 55th function in that table. Is that a accurate description of that? Yeah. And so, but the the order of functions, as you mentioned, per kind of version of the operating system may change. And so we're trying to use, we, we use the name just for simplicity's sake. Yeah. You know, maybe in the future, uh, if people are interested, we'll actually, that'd be a cool exercise to show people that through WinDebug. Yeah. Um, if you, if people would like that, it's a cool process and cool thing to learn. Um, but kind of keep that in mind whenever we, we kind of are articulating some of this information. And another reason too, is you'll notice if there's ever been a question as to why we don't, you know, spread the functions into the kernel, it's because, um, one, those functions can be relatively hard to find. And if people get access into the kernel, there's many ways to perform certain actions and it just becomes more of a spider web of capability. So, um, we kind of stop in the user mode transition to kernel. Yep. And Luke, can you hit that link one more time just to share it? So, uh, Luke made like a easy, easy way for people to navigate to Johnny's blog post. It's kernel dash callbacks dot DCP podcast.com. So, uh, I encourage everybody to check that out. Show Johnny a little bit of love. Ask some questions. You know, leave some feedback. Uh, yeah, all, all uh, that's great. If we people have comments, please let me know. Um, I didn't go over all, every callback known to mankind in Windows. One thing I do want to give um, kind of credit and information to is Matt Hand. He was one of the guests that we had on the DCP. He is coming out with a book called Evading EDR, I believe it is, um, and it actually goes really, really in depth in every kernel callback function and everything like that. So be on the lookout for that. Um, so um, shout out to him for that. Yeah, I encourage people just to check out that book as well, just because, uh, you know, I, I, oh man, Casey Smith, who was one of our most recent guests on the on the podcast, uh, he always points to this quote, which it, uh, from Carmen Medina, who is a either FBI or CIA, CIA analyst. And Carmen uh, has this quote that says, our ability to know is a function of our tools for knowing. Right. And uh, understanding our, our ability to know what's happening in our network is a function of the sensors that we use to provide telemetry. Right. And those sensors are very often from an endpoint perspective, the EDR. Right. And the idea the idea is, is that our ability to know about things is dependent upon our understanding or the capabilities and our understanding of those capabilities of the EDR products. And so I really encourage people to dig into that uh, that book that Matt Hand is coming out with. I don't know when it's going to be released. I know it's in kind of like pre pre print and doing some review around Black Hat. If I'm not mistaken, okay. so, so look out for it in the next month or so, and that's going to be a real deep dive. Matt Matt Hand is kind of coming at it from a well, he's a red teamer, so I don't know if uh, the book is explicitly from a red team perspective, but it's going to be useful for both blue teamers, red teamers, purple teamers, whatever whatever your role is. It's going to be going to be awesome. Yeah, and so we have Aaron S saying, really, really looking forward to getting into that book. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be really great, and it's going to be awesome for detection engineers, the types of people that we're targeting for this for this podcast. Thanks for thanks for commenting, Aaron. Okay, one, so one note about the the book, yep. real quick. If you uh, if you pre order a copy, you get access to like two of the chapters that are already out. Mm -hmm. If you want to start, you know, reading it now, there is some content that's available. If you if you pre order through No Starch, boom, there you go. Cool, thanks, Luke. All right, so let's. Um, I want to dig into this tool graph or this function graph. So we're just going to do a quick review of all the terminology because I find that even for people that I talk to a lot, I use, I start to use terms that have a very clear meaning to me, but maybe aren't so obvious to everybody else. So this is what we call the function chain. So conceptually, what what happened here is we found some sample that performed process injection, right? And we we took that sample and we started to dig into what functions does the sample call in order to achieve that behavior, process injection? And what we observed is that it calls four functions. The first function is kernel32 open process. What that does is it opens a handle to the target process, the process for which you're going to inject your code into, right? 
The second one is virtual alloc EX, which is also in kernel 32. And what that does is it allocates a, a buffer of memory in the, in the remote process. So let's say we want to inject into SVC host. We would open a handle to SVC host, and then we would allocate a memory buffer in the, mem in the process memory space of SVC host. Then we call kernel 32 write process memory. And what that does is it actually writes the code, whatever our, our shell code, let's say, into the memory buffer that was allocated by virtual alloc EX. And then we call create remote thread. And create remote thread says, I want you to now create a thread, but I want you to target the code that is stored in this memory buffer that was allocated as a result of virtual alloc EX. This is kind of what we call classic shell code injection, right? So or classic remote thread injection. Um, there's a couple different ways that we could refer to it. But this is this is like when I first started in the industry, I was literally told I took a uh, the Lenny Zeltzer Sans 508 or 6, 608, maybe 610. I forget exactly what it is, but the reverse engineering malware class. And I remember it may not have been in that class, but kind of conceptually, that was the level of, of uh, background I had with reverse engineering. That was like first time I ever started digging into malware samples. I remember being told, if you see open process, virtual alloc EX, write process memory, create remote thread, you are seeing process injection. And the, one of the major problems that I had is I didn't actually know what those functions did. And so I would start like running strings on what I presumed to be malware samples. And I'd be like, oh, I see write process memory in the strings. And so therefore this must be bad. I didn't actually understand how it, how it all worked. Hey, Jared. Yep. A uh, question for the viewers. Is there another function called, or is that similar to virtual alloc, but it's for local processes only? Yeah, yep. So there's a function called vir virtual alloc. Um, and there's also, I, I don't know what you're going for, but there is a function called virtual alloc that would only allocate uh, memory in the local process. Actually, there's a, is that what you were going for? Yeah, because essentially like you might see this like a very similar thing, but at the very end, you wouldn't see like create remote thread. You might just see like create thread and then you see virtual alloc. And that just yep. might mean someone is allocating memory right into their own process. In their own process. Yeah. So there's actually, um, Johnny and I have been doing a lot of research into process injection. I, I'm just going to kind of blow this one, but um, we're we're really trying to dig into what was what's the historical background on process injection. This is a little bit of a detour from the direction that we're trying to go, but it's it's really fun. And um, and what we found is that process injection actually came about in uh, approximately 1994. And there's this book called Advanced Windows Third Edition, and that's a book about the transition from uh, pre Windows 95 to Windows 95, where they went from 16 bit operating system to a 32 bit operating system. So today we run 64 bit operating systems. And many of you are probably familiar with the idea that you have system 32, which is where your 64 bit applications live. And then you have SysWow 64, which is where your 32 bit applications live. Well, in 1994, there was 32 bit, which was the kind of the new kid on the block, but you had 16 bit, which was the, the old one, right? And so this, uh, this, guy who worked for Microsoft named Jeff, Jeffrey Richter, who wrote this book, he actually has a chapter in the book that goes into the details about how process injection came about. And what they what happened was in 16-bit windows, all processes shared the same memory space. And so if I wrote to the memory of, you know, ostensibly the memory of one process, that process, uh, that data was accessible to everybody else, all the other processes. And so there's actually, it was actually quite common for different processes to share data and uh, access each other's data. And that was like just kind of a normal thing. And so when 32-bit Windows came out, I, I believe it was Windows 95, they, uh, there was a problem because a lot of legacy applications had this assumption baked in where they expected to have cross-process memory access, but now they didn't. And so then there was this problem that actually is not from like a malicious origin to where we were building applications and we had to port the applications to a 32-bit machine. And the question was, how do we actually execute or how do I, how do we actually share memory or how do we get our code to execute in a different memory, uh, memory space, a different processes, memory space. And this, you know, this isn't exactly what, what Jeffrey Richter came up with. Uh, what he came up with was this idea of, uh, loading DLLs. So you would load a, you would put a DLL on disc and then you would force the remote system to, or the remote process to load that DLL into, into its memory. So shell code is like an advancement on that. Um, but this, the overall pattern, still applies. You would call open process, uh, virtual alloc, write process memory, create remote thread, essentially. And so that's kind of where it came from, which was really awesome. One thing, the reason why this all came to my mind is on Windows 95, virtual alloc EX didn't exist. You only had virtual alloc. 
And so one of the one of the sections of the chapter, Jeffrey Richter actually goes into this discussion about we had this problem to where we had to allocate memory in a remote process, but we didn't have virtual alloc EX, which meant that we couldn't we could not allocate memory in the remote process. So what did he do? Well, what he found was that create remote thread did it did exist. And when you create a thread in a remote process, every thread has its own stack. And the stack is essentially memory, right? And so what he would do is he called create remote thread, point uh, started called the or created the thread in a suspended state, and then used that thread's stack as a memory buffer where he would store the the actual data that he wanted to like run or whatever. The the name of it was it was the name of the DLL he wanted to load. You would put that in there. And then you would call create remote thread again with load library, and you would specify the location of the stack from the previous thread that you created, and then you would execute it. So that that's pretty pretty nifty. But this is one of those things to where, you know, a lot of these behaviors or techniques that that attackers are using are not don't have an origin with a malicious use case. There's actually a lot of evidence that process injection comes from uh, has had a lot of development in the game hacking community because. If you want to, for instance, create an aim bot for you know Counter Strike, you you actually have to do lots of memory reads, and memory reads across processes is much more expensive than memory reads inside of a process, right? So uh, across process, you would call like read process memory, um, and internally it's a lot easier to actually do the do the memory read. And so what they do is they inject their code into you know the Counter Strike application or whatever, and then they would be doing local reads over and over instead of thousands or millions of remote reads and it would become much more efficient so that's that's kind of neat johnny i don't know if you leaned forward no 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 that's fine i was going to go more into that but we're wasting wasting i don't know if it's a i don't know if it's a waste it's fun yeah it's fun okay so that's uh that's that's that so we have this thing which i call a function chain which is just a a sequence of functions that were literally called by our malware sample one thing that's important to remember is this is just one sample that we're looking at it's not every sample that's possible, but you have to start somewhere, right? Instead of one of the things that I'm really interested in is this idea of like, you have to be able to build a detection for a single sample before you start to look at all the samples, right? And so we want to work on the fundamentals of how do we deal with a single sample? And then we could work on build like expanding that and do multi sample detections or something like that, multi chain detections. Okay. So then we talked about this idea of, uh, function call stacks, right? And so if I call open process, literally, like I explicitly call open process, implicitly behind the scenes, there's gonna be a sequence of calls that ultimately results in this these sys calls, right? And that's that's true for you know open process, virtual alloc, write process memory, create remote thread. It's true for all of them. Um, it's not true of every single function, but it's true of the vast majority of functions that you're going to encounter, okay? And then what we did is we were able to summarize this entire chain. So the, the interesting thing about this is, remember I was told kernel 32 open process, kernel 32 virtual alloc EX, kernel 32 write process memory, kernel 32 create remote thread. But the interesting thing about these function call stacks, this is just kind of a reminder, is it's possible to actually do this, right? I know the arrows aren't showing up, but you could call NT open process, NT virtual allocate virtual memory, NT write virtual memory, NT create thread EX and you would achieve the same objective, but you wouldn't be calling the functions that people expect you to call. And this is this is essentially the reason why it's valuable for us to build our telemetry generation in the kernel, because now it doesn't matter which of these functions you call, all of them are going to pass through the same syscall. And so if I'm in, on the kernel side of the syscall, then I'm going to catch it. Everybody, you good? Yeah, part of the reason why people often like, say you have this flow like this, and say someone were to call like the native function for virtual alloc ex <clears throat> or even the syscall that's because like there has been like it's known that vendors like edrs will hook on certain functions for telemetry and sometimes they would they would be able to either like typically find what that hooking was and try to execute lower than that yep. so that they their you know execution for that particular function goes unseen um, and that's why it's important for us to understand. It's like, you know, it's like, why do you really care if someone calls open process versus like the, the sys call for open process? Well, it's, um, I think like understanding the variability that's there for anybody in terms of the attack service is super important first off. And second off, it gives us all the vocabulary to use when communicating about like a particular attack. Um, because I know like there's like a 
dumping Elsass explanation, like a uh, tool out there that everybody was going crazy about uh, from like Outflank because it was called Dumper, because I believe it's like invoking native or native functions or syscalls or both. Yep. Yeah, syscalls. And everybody's like, oh, you get, it bypasses so many EDRs. It's like, well, why, why is that important? You know? And so, like, understanding this flow in general um, helps us understand, like, the capability or, you know, kind of the playground that an attacker has when they want to invoke um, some functions to execute some capability. Yep. yep. So, so tell me this. I'm an I'm a analyst or I'm a SOC manager. We have a Sysmon Event ID 10 on every system. And so I consider myself as having open process covered, right? Anything that's going to do open process, you know, I know that Sysmon Event ID 10 uh, gets me open process. So I consider myself as having like a, uh, that API covered. You're telling me that there's a way that an attacker can bust my little happy bubble so and execute NT open process. And then I'm not going to see it. That's so in that case, no, because, um, Sysmon is going to leverage the callback that we looked at last week called uh, it's a it's a hand it's a process handle callback um, process object handle callback um, and it leverages that to uh, kind of showcase that data whatever that happens and that's in the kernel so you it, that function if we were to go in the kernel this would eventually go into like obp create handle I think something like that and inside of there that makes the invocation for checking those callbacks to my blog yeah. um if anybody wants to check it out um <laughs> another way if people are curious about like different layers of these telemetry there is a there is a project out there i started called uh, telemetry source that um that can be used to uh kind of go and understand what you know sysmon what window security events and what like the threat intelligence etw provider which we'll get into here shortly boom. are collecting and how boom Okay, cool. Um, okay, so another thing just to kind of remind people, the cool thing about this tool graph is that the tool graph actually tells us about a bunch of different functional variations. So as I mentioned, you could call all the N the NTDLL, the native function versions. So you could call NT open pro NTDLL, NT open process, NT allocate virtual memory, NT write virtual memory, NT create thread EX. That's just one alternative variation. But there's actually... In this picture, there's 900 possible variations because you could take any function from this stack and combine it with any function in this stack and any function in this stack and so on and so forth. So you could choose any of the functions, combine them together. Turns out that there's 900 different combinations. The cool thing is, is that we're able to summarize all of that through this operation chain. So this operation chain is one chain that actually represents 900 possible functional variations. And so that allows us to think about this much more simply. But one of the caveats is, is that we're assuming that our telemetry uh, is in the kernel, is being generated in the kernel, and therefore would see the entire the entire stack, right? So if we're going to detect this, then we detect everything in the stack. That may not be true with your particular uh, EDR, for instance, or a particular, a particular event for a particular EDR. Okay, so the purpose of this this uh, session is what we want to do is we want to kind of talk about the idea that operations are actually what we see. So when we, when we talk about EDR telemetry, EDR telemetry doesn't correspond with the technique. There's no event that's a process injection occurred event that doesn't exist. What there is though, is there's a process access event or process open event. There's a thread create event. There's a process write event. There's a memory allocate event. Right. And so what we're doing is we're we're creating this operation chain and this operation chain allows us to to understand the types of telemetry that we should expect to see when this behavior occurs. But each event corresponds. This is the thesis corresponds with one operation. So you have an event and that event corresponds with one operation, not multiple operations. And so then the, there's a bunch of questions. Um, about you know which which operation should you choose, and we'll talk about all of this. But um, generally speaking, events correspond with operations. But just because you have an operation in the chain does not mean that your EDR collects that operation. And so I'll I'll let Johnny kind of touch on this a little bit. But we have an example of an EDR that happens to collect each of these operations that we'll we'll kind of jump into. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Jared. Yeah. So. Kind of what Jared was talking about, how 
operations are really what you're wanting to see when it comes to events. So what does that mean? Whenever you create a detection, and Luke, obviously feel free to jump in anytime here. Um, when it comes to a detection, um, what the analyst wants to see eventually is a process injection alert, right? Well, what that really is broken down into is events that are exposed that relate to these specific operations. Um, now, that being said, it's like, what do you deem worthy enough to put in the detection? But first, we have to identify what telemetry is available to us in our given like organization. This could come from multiple different sensors, too. Right. So like it's not just EDR. I think a lot of times people have such a big focal uh, point on like EDR only. There's like native telemetry that could be super useful as well when you want it to be uh, or when you can you can obtain it. Right. So <clears throat> so that being said, like. When we look at like uh, process open, like we talked about this the last stream, I had the blog on it, so it's easier to talk about. Um, that is exactly typical. Like that is exactly what the name is for Sysmon for uh, Event ID Ten. I think actually it's called Process Access. But process this, Access. That's yeah, correct. You know, same same kind of. I don't know. Access and open is probably a little different, but regardless, like. Um, that is how that's done. If there was a, you know, if we had an operation out here for process create instead of thread create, that's Sysmon Event ID 1. Um, there's also a, a Sysmon Event ID 11, which is file create, right? There's always that object and then action. Um, so that just goes to show that like events are built upon operations. Now, um, and this, this is something that we already, we already talk about them in this way, but I don't think people have explicitly thought about like people yeah. tend to not think about it explicitly. So generally speaking, if you start thinking about the different events that your EDR or you're, you know, collecting from the Windows event log or something like that, think about the kind of way that you describe those events and you're like, oh, this is a service creation event or this is a, you know, whatever you already are talking in this operation kind of lingo, I guess, or yeah. jargon. Exactly. And the thing is, too, now it's very possible to have detections that are built on one or more operation, depending on the events that are exposed to you and you enjoy it. I know, like, say if Luke and I talk about a detection, right? And I'm like, hey, what is your detection built off of? Right. Like he openly will say, like, in this particular instance, like, yeah, I have a like I'm doing a search on like thread creations for remote processes. And also, like, I'm looking to see if there's a right process to that same target from some source. Right. Well, it's OK. Well, like that's how we have the vocabulary. That way I have an understanding as another analyst or like engineer for these detections to say, say like, OK, like this is how Luke is looking at it. Now we know that like with injection that for uh, code execution, like getting a thread to execute, um, it doesn't have to be thread create. It could be something completely different. A K, it's like K user APC. It could be, you know, set thread context, whatever it may be. However, that lets me know what the advantages are to this detection and maybe some of the downfalls. So what's kind of the gap? And generally, well, the reason why we want to focus on this is from like an implementation perspective, it puts everybody on the same vocabulary plane. Um, and so that we can have those conversations. Now, like um, it's, it's almost like a detection pseudocode, if yeah. you will, yeah. right? If, yeah, if you only know Python and I know C Sharp, I'm going to describe the thing that I'm trying to do in general terms that you understand. And then we can figure out the exact implementation of the functions that we need to use in each of those yeah. languages. Um, great point. Yeah. So I'm having trouble sharing my screen on another browser. Like my computer is like all wonky. So I'm going to have to like ask probably Luke or Jared to like look up certain things and share it. So if you guys could look up telemetry source on GitHub, I can kind of like walk through yeah. some of that if you don't mind. I appreciate it. I have it open, Jared. If you okay. Want. Go for it. And so what we're going to kind of go through now is like once we understand what those operations are, how do we go and understand what certain things are collecting? So if you could click on the event mapping Google sheet. And zoom in for us a little bit. Oh, a lot of it. A lot of it. <laughs> no, I'm not trying to open the insert menu. That yeah, and you can go to, go to Sysmon if you don't mind. Great. So if you scroll down, go to open process. Great. So even ID 10. So this is a map and a long time ago. I probably need to update it. Um, this is kind of like <clears throat> the old way I was doing it. But anyways, part of this project is meant so that other engineers and researchers don't have to go back and figure out 
how certain telemetry is being generated, right? Like I've already gone through the hard bit for that. And like in general, it's, it's relatively easy. So like um, in this particular instance, I'm showing that like open process and NT open process are going to later transition into the kernel for which there's going to be some like some uh, process object uh, callback, whether that's going to be a pre or post callback. Um, I didn't really, back then when I created this, I didn't really truly understand kernel callback functions, hence why you see OB register callbacks. But anyways, um, we, we know that. So if we think back to our operation graph, like, okay, great. Like, let's theoretically, let's, let's kind of set the stage here so we kind of can do this. So let's say that, like, um, in this organization that we have, we have MDE and Windows security events. Okay, good. Awesome. So why are we looking at Sysmon? Because it's already been mapped out and a lot of the same EDRs are going to leverage the same capability, especially when it comes in the kernel. Whenever Microsoft exposes these functions and routines, that means they're going to support them. And like vendors are going to use this, right? And MDE definitely leverages kernel callback functions. Um, and there's a uh, function in MDE called um, within, uh, I think it's device events called open process API call, I believe it is. But they only are going to do like LSAS processes, right? So like you wouldn't, so in this particular instance, do they collect that information? Yes, but it's only for target processes that are LSAS. Okay, so issue, right? So we want to jot that down as like an engineer. Um, if you want to go down to the threat intelligence ETW provider, if you don't mind. Uh, Jared, what was the second call you called? Memory allocate. So uh, virtual alloc EX, correct? Yeah. Great. It's so, like, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So in here, um, you will see that there are, I think, four different events for alloc, they call it alloc VM. So the threat intelligence ETW provider is a um, ETW provider that's registered in the kernel. So it's obtaining uh, information in the kernel. Essentially what they're doing, it's not technically function hooking, but what they've done is They've modified operating system code to basically write ETW events whenever certain APIs are called. Um, so this is a good example of that. Um, there are certain virtual alloc events. So you'll see like even ID6, for example, is alloc VM underscore local, where number one is alloc VM underscore remote, right? So that means remote process local and then there's two other ones that are looking to see if that was done in kernel or user mode they'll look to see what the the process context was so um that's our context i believe it is so the, they'll check to see that okay so great so we have checked that off we have telemetry mde actually um collection of threat intelligence etw provider but they don't do the allocate vm uh telemetry so that that, that could be an issue so <clears throat> We, the telemetry is capable. We have that somewhere, but MD is just not going to leverage it. So we might not be able to use that for a detection. What was the third one, Jared? Process write. Yeah, process write. So write process memory. Um, if you want to scroll down a little bit, Luke, there it's number is. Number 14. Number 14. So scroll up a little bit. Oh, shoot. <laughs> There we go. Thank you. Yep. So 14 is going to be write VM remote. And we can see here that the function on the right hand side is NT write virtual memory, which is the kernel function that's done. Yep. Okay, great. So that's awesome. So now um, actually the same uh, kind of the same flow. Not exactly. We'll see read process memory as well for all you dump, uh, dumping LSS fans. Anyways, um, and we have uh, create remote thread as well. Yep. Yep. So we so this, I believe um, this one actually is an MD. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. I believe it is an MD. It's called Write Process Memory API. I call it. Am I correct on that, Jared? I want to say. Sure. Uh, I'm pretty sure. I don't have it in front of me, but I'm pretty okay, sure I'm that's like, what it's called. Exactly. Cool. So then, go back to Sysmon for me, will you, real quick. So, I know where this is going. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Event ID eight. Yeah. There we go. Create mode thread. So you can pull that via another callback called PS set create thread notify routine. Now inside that note that um, routine. There is a parameter that gets passed in. It might be, I think it's like info or something like that. And essentially what I'll tell you is if the creation of the thread is remote or if it is local, right? MDE extras this. It's called a create remote API call. Cool. So question for you, Luke. Um, <laughs> there see. are four operations that are being done. There's open process, but we've under, we understand that that can be collected. MDE is collecting that. Here, let me pull. Let me pull this back up so that. Uh, yeah, I was yeah. gonna switch back to you. There you go. Okay, cool. God dang it. Uh, sorry, I don't know how to. 
Okay, there, there we go. go. <laughs> so pro process open is being collected, but it's only for the target process being LSS. Memory allocate can be through the threat intelligence ETW provider. I don't believe... Um, Maybe we should not talk about what uh, MDE filters just yet, because that might add more complexity to what I think your question is going to be. Okay. So let's say that's Cape. Okay. Actually... Okay. So the ETW, just imagine that MDE collects everything that the ETW yeah. provider. Yeah, let's provides. just yeah, let's just say that. Yeah, great. Okay. okay. So my question, and we know that like they can collect the you know process right in uh, the the remote thread yeah. uh, loop. Okay. So my question to you as a defender, whenever you're creating process injection for this particular procedure, you know, sequence of operations, what would be the detection or detections? It doesn't have to be in Custo and MDE. But what would be like your pseudocode detection or your preferred method and why and what would be the gaps of that said detection? So I have a I have a question here. Your your operation name says thread create. Yeah. Uh, am I to assume that you only mean create remote thread? Is create thread not an option here? That's a good uh, question. Uh, I think we have or is it not relevant to the answer. operation. Yeah, it's just not. It's not in here. But yeah, assume that it's remote. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what I would probably do um, is I would have at least, and I'm we're saying that we assume that each one of these is visible to MDE, right? That's right. For the sake yep. of this argument, that's not just for a disclaimer. That's not actually true. There is a lot of filtering and there's a lot of like uh, summarizing and things that happen with, I forget what the exact word is that they use, but with MDE. So like, like Johnny said, process open, it, it only collects LSAS, uh, opening handles to LSAS. But for the sake of this portion of the discussion, we should just ignore that because that just makes it more complicated. Yep. So I'm assuming that I have a, a solid primary key to link telemetry from all four of these together. Um, I'm going to have a detection for each of them. I'm going to have a higher priority detection if I have all four happening um, that are related, but I still want to know if the other ones are at least even attempted because I want to know as a detect an engineer if someone's trying something that they may not have permissions for at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to have at least an analytic for all of them, uh, but my higher priority is going to be if I can see all of them happening in a chain. Um, assuming that I had to pick one, I would probably go for create remote thread if they're all on an equal playing field because at that point I know um, that the effect was actually achieved and somebody is actually accessing another process versus just attempting to allocate memory or opening a yep. handle to a process. One, one thing I wanted to ask the viewers, too, for those that are watching, um, feel free to say what your pseudo detection logic would be while we're walking through this, because mm -hmm. everybody might have a different thought on what this might be. So, Luke, uh, go back to that. So um, I really like your point of how you want to have an analytic for all four. Right. Um, but if you had to choose one, it would be create a thread. And if I understand you correctly, it's because um, all of these I'm about to I'm about to say a word that Jared's going to be like, hmm? um, all of the operations prior to create thread are necessary in order for the code to execute within the remote thread, but they're, they're not, not sufficient. sufficient. But they're not. That doesn't mean that a that re, that code was executed in the remote thread. But create thread does showcase that. Correct. I'm yes. So, I'm so proud but, of you two for knowing those words. <laughs> like but, a tear to my eye. In my in my biased knowledge, I know that more ways to do this use a process open than use yep. a create remote yeah. thread. But so if but, I zoom out, that's not my answer. But you pinned me down to just yeah. this one graph. Okay, well, that's, a that's a that's a good. So, uh, Go ahead, let you. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> the 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 reason. So I think I think of this. This is going to show the limits of my math math education probably because i'm a history major Jared was but, a history major so leave yeah. alone, you know? but like the way that i understand it is uh you have like calculus one or calculus and then calculus two or you have algebra one and algebra two and algebra one from what i i didn't realize this as a kid but um 
algebra one is like single variable algebra. So it's find X is the, is the problem, right? So it'd be like four equals two plus X, find it, find the value of X or something like that. Right. And so it's single variable, right? But then in algebra two, once you've mastered single variable algebra, now they give you X and Y, they give you multi multiple variables. And now you have to figure out how to deal with multiple variables. But if you didn't, if you weren't competent at doing single variable algebra, you'd be screwed in, in multiple variable algebra, essentially, right? And so what we're doing here is we're essentially doing single variable algebra. We're saying, you know, find the answer for this chain and we could worry about other chains later on, right? Because uh, that, that only makes it harder, right? And so it's like, we have to be able to solve the answer, like find the answer for this, and then we could worry about how we find the answers for everything else later on. Yeah. Yep. So great point. And so like, I know Luke, I want to touch on Luke so that he wanted to look like open process. Yep. Um, I kind of want to discuss like what we all have discovered with an issue with that is open process obviously allows you to obtain a handle to a particular process, but it doesn't say what was done with that handle. Um, you, you know that you have like a max required amount of rights that you can use. It doesn't mean you use those rights. And so it's hard to determine if you read a process's memory, if you wrote to someone else's memory, if you created a thread in that, you know, it, it's hard to say. Um, but if we start to go down this operational flow, we, we start to see that. Now, for me, this is probably how I would create a detection, because, like, again, this doesn't mean Luke was wrong. Right. It just means that, like, we have different things. We have different ways to approach it. And that's, in my opinion, the beautiful piece to detection. There's never one right answer. There's what is someone's experience? What is someone's knowledge? And then both can play a part into covering gap within an organization. So Luke wanted to focus specifically on the create mode thread. That's great. We've seen that a lot. I think that's awesome. With my knowledge of what MDE collects, I know that they cover a variety of different execution mechanisms for process injection. So not just create mode thread. They also do queues or APC. And I, I want to say maybe that's, set thread, set thread context. context yep. Yeah. So they do all three of those. And I know they have right process memory. So I would set my main analytic on write process memory because I know um, that some like a target process wrote to another process's memory um, after it allocated and there's some type of code sitting there. And then I would do a join probably on the three different types of execution to print out what they were um, and go, Jared, I see you smiling. So I want to know why you're smiling, but yeah. I'm, I'm smiling because I just... I just gave a spiel about how we need to do single single chain detection, and then you're like, "Well, I know that there's other chains, so I'm yeah, yeah, not sorry. I know yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sitting here like, uh, and then I also Johnny's shitting on my detection because he made me ignore any other chains. <laughs> and then yeah. I, I also know that, uh, for instance, other chains don't require you to call write process memory, and so you could bypass your detection as well. Yeah, so there, that see that's that's the key point though, there, right? Is like there's different layers to detection, and like understanding those gaps, right? You don't have to call right process memory, right? There's things called like atom bomb and shit like that. Yep. And so like, um, am I allowed to say shit on YouTube? You can say whatever. Uh, uh, yeah. YouTube sure. doesn't give a shit. Oh, nice. Cool. So <laughs> good to know. We're trying to be so, family friendly though, aren't we? Yeah. Well, if there's anybody below the age of 13 that's watching, then I'll try not to say shit anymore. Well, one, um, I'm impressed that you know at all what we're talking about. <laughs> you're 13. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um so like anyways yeah so there, there's definitely gaps to my detection as well right and so like um understanding i know we're coming up on time like this stream's actually longer than other ones understanding that flow and as we start to go in further episodes we want to start to add maybe different operation flows and procedures onto this and then start to understand okay we see these different ones um are, where does telemetry lie for each chain? Or there, is there a pivot point, aka some operation that is done in each operational chain, each sequence of events, um, and in turn that we could use as like a pivot or kind of like one of those main uh, events that we want. Now, keep in mind, um, some events, and we can touch on this in the future, are better made, I call them primary and secondary telemetry, meaning primary telemetry are things that we want to use as our primary source for detection it's like it's like the glue it's the foundation and luke feel free to speak up here because we've talked about this a lot too um secondary to secondary telemetry is more for context 
right? So those would be things like log on sessions, process GUIDs, process IDs, things like that. It's telemetry that is exposed to us um, or metadata that we can use for context moving forward, but it's not something you want to use as the foundation of our detection because um, it either might not have all the information we need and by itself it can't really stand as a this behavior happened. And, and you say, but Johnny, that's really expensive to have all that data. Yeah. Well, it's okay. Your secondary data sources don't have to sit in your SIM with the rest of your data for high availability. You can shove that stuff into S3 yep. or put it somewhere that you might need it that's a slower, more low-cost uh, area for when you yep. do need it. I do want to preface, too. Uh, I've said this in the DCP podcast, and I'll say it here. I'm not talking about mom and pop shops. So we talk yeah, I'm not talking about mom and pop shops for this. Hey, there, hey, there's some non mom and pop shops that can't afford the the prices I agree. that Splunk I'm just saying. Down. <laughs> there's always that. There's always uh, but can the mom and pop shop, the donut shop down the street, do this? It's like, no. Johnny and I have actually had an argument about that. But... Yes, yes, we have. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give my answer. I guess. Great. Yeah. Oh, well, so it's oh, gonna we're be. Jared and I, guys. It's about to be. It's about to be a little. We had we had some comment on like the first. It was a comment on the first session of DCP Live that Luke just shared with uh, Johnny and I, and it basically said, "I really enjoy how Jared is philosophical and how Johnny brings the technical edge." And so I'm trying to live up to that person's <laughs> expectations. So whoever wrote that, thank you for that that feedback. Um, what I did is I went in and added uh, what I think the event names are. This is just off the top of my head, so they may be slightly off. Uh, this might be NT allocate virtual memory remote remote API call, right, Johnny? Yeah, I makes it yeah. even longer. It's like I the longest. I can't remember if they the longest name in history. One, but yeah, let's just anyway, say um, I'm pretty sure they have an event in MDE, whether they collect it or not. I don't know. Um, okay, so there's there's this thing called the free energy principle by a guy named Carl Friston out of King's College, London, and what what he basically says is one of the things that we the question is, is how do we deal with uncertainty, right? So we don't know if process injection has actually been executed on the system. What we're trying to do is we're trying to collect the information that would allow us to ascertain or approximate as close to possible whether process injection had, had actually occurred. And so then the question is, is what, which of these events provides the most information? And we're talking about information in like a Shannon, uh, like an information theory, Shannon entropy type, type context. And so what we have to think about are all of the possible paths, right? So imagine uh, if you're familiar with Bloodhound, you know about attack paths. Imagine that this is an operation path, right? But there's, there's, a, there's a number of different operation paths, many of which are benign or not, not relevant to process injection. And so the question is, is which of these operations allows me to reduce the most uncertainty um, of whether or not this particular attack path or this particular operation path was actually actually executed and so the question is is if i see thread creation what like what other attack paths in or which which other attack paths include thread creation how many attack paths are there that include thread creation in that in that path right versus if i see process open how many paths include process open that aren't process injection and the the answer is almost certainly. I haven't. I mean, we haven't enumerated every single path that's possible, but there are more reasons why you would open a handle to a process than there are why you would create a thread. And the reason why I know I, I can say that is that in order to create a thread, you must have a handle to the process, and so that means that thread thread creation is a subset of all of the paths that would include process open. So the paths that include thread creation are a subset of paths that include process open. So for instance, what can I do with process open? Well, I could terminate a process. I could write to a process memory. I could read from a process memory. I could query the process command line. I can um, allocate memory. I could protect memory. I could do all kinds of different things. There's, there's a ton of different things I, can op I could choose to do once I open a process handle. Um, but there's very few, rel relatively very few reasons why I would create a thread. But so I would probably use as the foundation of my detection thread creation for this particular, particular operation chain. So this is the sing like with the single chain in mind. Now, just because I've observed that a thread was created doesn't mean that thread is is executing malicious code, right? And so then the next question is is how do is there a way to ascertain 
what code the re the newly created remote thread is actually executing and was that code code that was loaded by the same process right so um then then you would want to do you would start with the thread creation and then you would try to correlate that with a uh, process write a lot of times i think in mde your best bet is going to be something based off of like a process identifier of some sort right and the timestamp and you would look for some sort of time correlation now the better answer would be the actual memory address but that memory address is not collected by md as far as i understand so the memory address of the thread that's being executed so when you create a remote thread you have to say hey create a thread in process x and no notepad.exe and have the start address of the threads execution be this address and so what what i would be interested in doing is saying hey i saw the thread was created at address one two three four five let me go see if there's a process write event that wrote to address one two three four five and if there was that would raise my suspicion even higher so that's the way that that's the way i would go about doing it is which of these op so a fundamental idea is that you you must always start with only one operation right you can only look at one operation at a time and a lot of people will say oh well i do correlation so i look at multiple operations well which which operation are you basing the join on because that's you you can look at two different events but the way that you specify your join you're going to look at one event first and then you're going to join based on the results that you get from that one event and that could change that that will change your picture and so there's always there's always one event that's first my first event in this case whoops would be thread creation my second event that i would use to join it would be process write so that's my and answer. what gaps would that lead to what gaps um well like of course there's the other operation chains but within this operation chain um i think the gaps would be there would be some false positives because surely there's some applications that are doing injection they're doing injection so it depends on your definition of false positive but they're doing injection but they're doing it it's not malicious activity it's purposeful activity i think like edrs would be an example of that <laughs> semantic <where>, yeah <laughs> I just thought that's a cool stream in the future uh, would be for us to go through in a sim and how we deal with false positives. Yeah, That'd be yeah cool. for sure. I was going to say, like, also, how do you if if I have an EDR vendor that says, hey, I cover process injection, how do you quantify what that is? Yeah, that's a good point. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So one way that we could do I mean, one way you theoretically could do that is you could map out all of the known different operation chains for process injection so ap johnny's already alluded to apc injection there's set thread there's thread hijacking which uses like set thread context there's file mapping injection which is just a way to allocate there's there, I, I don't know there's all kinds there's something like 15 different operation chains or something like that um and then you could you could run them this is i mean this is essentially what we think purple teaming is at specter ops not to shill that idea but the idea is is that we're going to run the different variations and see how your your controls actually stack up against them so if we ran five different operation chains right so we run this let's say we run this whatever tool executes this operation chain um the question is is do we detect it if the answer is yes it's like okay well did we detect it because it's just we just detected the tool or did we detect it because we detect that behavior so then the second test is okay well let's run a different tool that runs that same operation chain and see what happens and if it detects that it's like cool okay well now let's make some more substantial changes what if we get rid of the thread creation and this is where like apc injection comes in so apc injection the cool thing about it is you're not creating a thread you're hijacking a, an existing thread right you're redirecting an existing thread's execution and so if like my detection for instance that i just explained is dependent upon the creation of a thread but if you don't create the thread then i'm not going to see it right and so the idea is, is that you could use apcs or you could do tr traditional classic thread hijacking which is uh basically suspend thread get thread context set thread context resume resume thread also not bypass safe it. also not safe for threads whatsoever no yeah yeah don't don't do that if it's like an important if it's something important basically <laughs> yeah but yeah so, so everybody we will go the next couple wait go ahead who said that luke well i was gonna say so a lot of those are actually classified as different sub techniques so the argument could be made 
like does it even belong in the same detection like is it a gap if it's not if it's not even the same yeah technique? i think so there's what, what if there are ways wrong? that we could talk about in a subsequent session to determine like okay so, so this is my contention i'm not trying to i'm not trying to get on miter for this but jamie williams please don't listen yeah categorization and sub of techniques and sub techniques in within miter is like kind of like oh they seem like they they're the same and so it's like best effort but i my contention is that there's actually a scientific way for us to say these operation chains are mutually detectable and so what you would do is you would stack the two operation chains on top of each other and you would see where the overlap was so like if you let's say you did this i mean these are the same exact ones but let's say you have two tools and you take their operation chain and you look at them and you're like okay well yep those are the same those are the same those are the same those are the same Great, we're good to go. But uh, just to kind of show, this is you don't don't share too much. We're doing this next week or ne next time. Okay, well, I'm just I'm just yeah yeah yeah. That's okay. This would be like uh, sorry, the picture's not going to be great, but it would be like APC create. So now what I could do is I could say okay, well for this one my detection is fundamentally built on thread creation. Well, the problem here is that. My detect like this second operation chain doesn't include thread creation, therefore they're not mutually detectable. They are mutually detectable on this kind of sorry, I get confused between my two screens. Um, between the first half, right? But as I mentioned with kind of the Carl Friston uh, free energy principle, the first half is going to be more error prone in the false positive direction, right? So um, that's less than ideal, I guess, is the the answer. Cool. So like moving forward, what we're going to do in the next stream is kind of go keep going along this process of like having these different operational change chains and identifying telemetry and then maybe detections. But also as we start to add chains, we're going to be doing exactly this, putting them on top of each other, seeing now that these are a part of the attack service, part of our uh, detect <clears throat> me, detection capability. How do we want to modify our detections, et cetera? And then next week or not next week, but the, the next time, Maybe I'll even pop, pop open uh, some tests and MDE and start share sharing some queries and things like that. So uh, if no one has any questions, comments, concerns, et cetera, um, we're pretty much over time by now, but I'm happy everybody. hope you stuck with us. Um, we really appreciate your guys' you know, time hanging out with us tonight. Um, and please reach out to us if you have any questions um, or comments or things you'd like to see, right? Like if there's like, hey, I'd like to see you guys do more stuff in, like, say, a sim, like, say, like, uh, you know, Sentinel or, you know, Splunk or just doing queries in Custo inside of MDE. We'd be happy to do so. Um, we just want to know what you guys are interested in, et cetera. So, the other two guys got anything to say before we uh, close it for tonight? No. Thanks, everybody. And uh, be sure, like we mentioned, check us out on, check out our YouTube channel, which, if you're watching this, you may be on YouTube, you may be on LinkedIn or Twitter, but. Uh, we're trying to kind of build that that channel, youtube.dcppodcast.com. Um, so feel you know feel free or please, we're begging you to uh, <laughs> subscribe to the channel so you can keep up to date on like all of our live sessions or our kind of full length interview style podcasts. Um, also check out Johnny's blog on Colonel Callbacks. So Colonel-Callbacks.dcppodcast.com. Um, feel free to reach out, ask us any questions, and we're happy happy you joined us, and we'll see you again next time. Bye, everybody. Cheers.